Right, I'm going to introduce Monica first. Monica is a social anthropologist and she has been studying the Calabit of Borneo since 1986. Um, in 2007-2011, she co-led a major research project in the Calabit Highlands called the Cultural Rainforest Project. And then in 2017 to 2018, she was a research fellow at the Sirac Museum, um, working on the new Borneo's Cultural Museum. And she began studying beliefs about dragons among all the peoples of Borneo, including the Chinese, the Malay, as well as all the indigenous groups. She continues this research. Among her publications are two books on the Kalabit, The Forest Source of Life, and Tukudrini, Cosmic Traveler, Life and Legend in the Heart of Borneo. Uh, I think uh, Friends of Sarap Museum might have copies to be sold, I'm not 100% sure, but do get in touch with us if anyone's interested in the books. Um, she made museum collections for the British Museum and Sarap Museum in 18, 1980-86, that's interesting, 1986 to 1988. And she is currently curator of the Southeast Asian Museum and collection at the University of Hull. Her talk is going to be about the hearth, which is the center of community in Borneo societies like the Kalabit, whom she has been studying for 30 years. Um, this is because it is at the hearth that the rice meal is cooked and eaten. And Rice is associated with the women and wild foods associated with the men. Rice is fed to married couples, to their descent, dependents and their descendants. And through this feeding, rice, rice, oh, I'm getting this wrong. Rice based kinship is generated, a form of kinship grounded not just by biology, but in the feeding. It is the basis of social hierarchy, which is grounded in the huge shared meals at Irao feast provided by the host couple. And Monica, I turn it over to you. Please let us know more about the hearth and the rice based kinship. Well, hello everybody. Very nice to see you all. Um, I'm sorry I can't see you all in person, but I thought I'd just show my face at the beginning so you can see who's talking to you. Uh, and then I'll uh, switch over to slides so that I can uh, let you um, have a visual um, sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen now and, um, and I hope this will send us to uh, my PowerPoint. Okay, um, I hope that's now working. Yeah, can yes, you all it see is. it? Yes. Okay, so this is an image um, of the community that I have been studying since 1986, um, which is called Padale, which is, actually you can't really see the, the longhouse very well because it's at the very bottom and it doesn't seem to have come out very large, but you can just see the top of the houses. Um, it is a longhouse community uh, in the Calabit Highlands. And I will be talking about my research in the Calabit Highlands and the significance of the hearth and the rice-based kinship there. But um, I'd like you all to just bear in mind that I think what I'm saying uh, has got relevance for other communities in Borneo uh, and more widely in, in the region. Um, because I believe rice is very central to the structure of society, to kinship, and to the nature of, of hierarchy. So in 1986, when I arrived in the Calabit Highlands, um, there was no road going up there, uh, and it was quite a, a journey. You had to fly to Barrio and then uh, take, you know, walk through the forest, which uh, took between nine and 12 hours. Um, to get to Padale. And so not a lot was brought in from the outside world. And people really relied very heavily on the forest for uh, craft work and for food. Um, there, there's been a lot of change. 
because now there is a road and a lot of people work down in town. There's a lot more money around and it's much easier to bring things up. But people who live in Padale, uh, although there are fewer of them, do still rely very heavily on the natural environment and do still live basically in the same way that they did in the 80s uh, when I did uh, most of my long-term field work. I continued to do field work after I did my first two years in 86 to 88, which was for my PhD. And uh, I, uh, so I, I still continue to do that field work, um, but I have now shifted to looking at um, beliefs among a, a number of different groups in Sarawak. Uh, my interest is, uh, was always on the significance of um, the, the hearth and of rice. Uh, I went to work in the Calabit Highlands because I knew that they, uh, they grew both wet and dry rice, in fact. So, so this, this, this topic is very central to my own work. Um, now this is Pat Mine Longhouse, another longhouse uh, about uh, four hours walk from Padale going towards Barrio in the 1950s. This photograph was taken by someone called Guy Arnold who visited at that time and wrote a book called Longhouse and Jungle. So you can see it's a, it's a long structure and I mean most of you are probably in Sarawak and you know very well what longhouses look like but some of you may not be. So um, it, they, they used to be uh, thatched and um, they used to be a very simple long structure. It's not very much um, sticking out at the sides as it were. And Calabit longhouses were temporary. They were rebuilt every few years. Uh, not like some of the other groups like the Cayenne who built very long lasting uh, longhouses and then had temporary field houses. The Calabit longhouses were rebuilt very very regularly and in different configurations because their social structure was much more fluid. Uh, leaders changed regularly. Uh, now, this is the interior of Padale Longhouse in 1987. And you can see um, that it's very open plan and very communal in effect. Um, so the center of the longhouse is the center of the longhouse socially, uh, but uh, there is a, so in the sense that the leading couple of the longhouse traditionally lived in that center and other people clustered around their close relatives and then their more distant relatives at the end. Um, but it, 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 everybody lived together in effect. Um, and the longhouse consisted of a, uh, a long row of hearths. And you can see those along the left-hand side. So, Many Borneo longhouses are not so open plan as this. Uh, the Calabit longhouse is sort of known for being very open plan in this way. And in fact, Padale is a bit more open plan than say Barrio, which has got a few more divisions. There's a lot of innovation, a lot of um, different ways of constructing a longhouse nowadays. And we'll come back that, to that in a minute. So this is Sina Ben, who was the last uh, wife of Pungulu Miri, who is a very major Calabit figure uh, who lived in the southern part of the highlands um, at her hearth, uh, blowing up the fire. Uh, and um, she's got the, the, the structure above the, the, the fire uh, there too. You can, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so the hearth is absolutely central to the household. Um, so I call the household a hearth group because it is centered on that hearth and the cooking that takes place at that hearth. Um, it is, the, the, the hearth is defined as the place where rice meals are cooked. Um, it, it isn't a hearth unless it's for cooking meals. And I, I think that's true in all cultures really around the world. That's what we mean by the word hearth. It's not just a fire to warm you, it's a fire for cooking. And um, it, it, at that time in the 80s, everything was still cooked uh, on this open fire. It was an interesting experience for myself and my husband when we arrived there with our baby daughter, Molly, because we had to learn to cook on an open fire. Um, and uh, obviously we'd not done this before. In England, you don't do that. Uh, and uh, it, it was uh, it, it was it was interesting and 
it was difficult, but it was rather wonderful too. I think it, it to to be reliant on on your hearth in that way. Um, but I wasn't terribly good at looking after my hearth. I don't think the ladies would say that I kept my bathroom so clean that you could eat off the floor, but I wasn't all that good at keeping my hearth tidy. So they came and helped me quite often to, to tidy it up. Um, now this shows the way that um, the Calabit longhouse at Padale changed over the years. This is a painting done by a young friend called Erin Lumley for the book to Cadrini Cosmic Traveler. And um, you can see that in the 1950s, it was quite a simple structure and it became much more complicated by 1986. So in the 1950s, you had a division down the middle between uh, an inner area, literally inner area called the Dalim, which is where the, um, the hearths are, were. And um, that's the lower part, the, the beige part. The upper part was, is called the Dalim, the, the Tatal, Sorry, I'm getting all mixed up here. The Tawa. <laughs> Sorry about that. The Dalim and the Tawa. The Tawa is where visitors were accommodated and where men spent a lot of their time. And you can see there are fireplaces there, but they are for keeping warm uh, and for sometimes for cooking meat in the evening, but not for cooking rice meals. Um, the hearths, uh, which are, you can see, they're rather tiny, but there's a row of uh, five of them that you can see along the bottom side in the dalim, those are for cooking the rice meal. You also can see some little drops of water, those are washing places. And then if you look at the lower part of the, um, of the painting, and that's Padale in 1986, and you can see that the dalim uh, with the hearths is, is still there. And it's, a bit, uh, it's a little bit more complex. It's got some sort of divided off areas at the back. Those are toilets and places for washing dishes and so on. But essentially it's the same, but the tower is, is sort of gone. It's turned into uh, storage and sleeping rooms. And so there isn't really a place for visitors and there wasn't really a place for, for men, a separate place. Sometimes there was a sort of divided off back part of it, which was partial. And men did sometimes go and work there, but they tended to spend more time in the, in the Dalim around the hearth, uh, I found in the 80s. So um, I think there was a so social shift. And so what I want you to think about is the distinction between hearths and fireplaces there. The hearth uh, maintains its position. Um, and this is the structure of a hearth. It, so the, the hearth is the tatal, it's called tatal at the bottom, the actual fire. But above it is the raran, which is where all the firewood is stored and lots of other things as well, such as the salt, which people uh, make in the highlands out of salt springs and they dry it over the hearth and then they store all sorts of baskets and brooms and many other things up there too. Um, but it's it's a major structure uh, and getting firewood in is a regular and very important job, obviously. Now, um, the rice meal uh, is, eat, well, well, when I was there in the 80s and up until recently, really, the rice meal was always eaten adjacent to the hearth. And nowadays, it isn't always, it's often eaten on a table. There's a change taking place. But um, the hearth does still have a significance and people feel that it needs to still be kept burning. And they often will um, boil kettles on it at least, even if they don't cook on it because they've got a separate gas cooker. So the hearth in the eighties and nineties was a source of warmth, but primarily it was for cooking the rice meal. And cooking is really central to being human more broadly. It, it makes us um, different from all the other species because only humans have fire, of course. And the rice meal that uh, was cooked at the hearth, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm going to speak about the sort of 80s and 90s, and maybe early 2000s, um, and, and there are, have been changes, as I say, but I'm going to use the present tense. The, hearth, the, the rice meal that's cooked at the hearth three times a day is eaten by the hearth by the people that belong to the hearth group. It isn't usual for people from outside the hearth group to eat there unless they are visitors from another longhouse or there is some sort of special occasion. Uh, so, uh, and sometimes if there is a visitor from outside the longhouse, then people will be invited from other hearth groups. And here, 
Um, this is Sina Ben. Uh, and she's hosting Ede Ulun. And because of that, other people have come along to eat uh, who are from other hearth groups uh, because of the fact that there's a visitor. Um, so that uh, she's generating a, a bigger group in a sense, a temporarily, um, which is kin based essentially, because all of these people are related. Everyone conceives them of themselves as related in the long house. It is rice that is the central uh, food um, and the, in terms of overt focus. It matters how much rice you eat. People will count how many bundles of rice because rice is packed in bundles, um, as we can see here. And, uh, you, you know, it's noted if you've eaten one or two or three and people are always very proud of the fact that they can eat more. So, of course, you eat other things, too, but it is rice that is absolutely central. And the things that are eaten with rice are, are called penguman, which means that the, which is eaten with rice. And I said earlier that I went to do my field work in the Highlands uh, initially because I heard that they grew rice in both wet and dry fields. I found that very interesting. And here we've got some images of wet and dry fields. Um, they no longer uh, use dry fields, actually. Uh, only wet fields are now made. But uh, in the 80s and 90s, dry fields were very significant in Padale, not in Barrio, because in Barrio they haven't got land uh, that can really be used for, uh, for dry fields. That's the original reason. They do also have a lot of land that was converted into wet fields. It was um, swampy originally, but they were able to remove the peat from that and they, they made lots and lots of wet fields and everyone knows about the barrio uh, wet rice fields if they live in Sarawak. Um, but in the southern part of the highlands they had a lot of very good land that was not uh, you know suitable for making wet fields and they made huge dry fields as well and wet fields were made in, uh, in, in river uh, valleys and streams um, and uh, in the Culture Drain Forest project on which I worked with a group of archaeologists and environmental scientists that Anita referred to earlier, we did discover that uh, we, we did earth cores to try and find out how long people have been growing rice. And we found that there are certain places along the Kalapang River, which flows through the southern part of the highlands and is the origin of the Baram, actually, um, where they have been making, uh, there have been little communities focused on very small areas of wet uh, rice cultivation for some hundreds of years. And they probably weren't making dry fields because they didn't have the metal tools to do that. Um, but um, it, there's a long history of using these particular little places, but it only goes back. Um, it's long, but it's only say four or 500 years before that. Um, it's probable that people relied um, on Sago even though nowadays um, the Kalabit don't eat sago any longer, of course, many other people do eat sago, including the Panan, who were living in the highlands too. And um, there are huge sago groves in the Kalabit highlands, which uh, our team believe were anthropogenic, made by humans. Um, and there are far too many of them to just use the leaves for thatching, which people do use sago leaves for. They were um, undoubtedly a sources of food. Um, but the Kalabit then shifted to growing lots more rice. And that was probably when they, be, when they got metal tools to enable them to make much bigger dry fields. Um, not so much the wet fields, because the large areas of wet fields that we've got in Barrio are, are fairly recent. Um, now, this is a, a rice meal uh, in the forest, and I just thought it was a rather beautiful image, um, because this is um, a rice meal that we had during the Culture Drain Forest project research. And you can see uh, the, the ingredients of it. You can see the rice, which here is actually um, both packeted and I think there may also be some uh, rice that's cooked not in packets, uh, not, not soft, because the Galebic uh, cook rice traditionally all mashed up and soft and packed in bundles, but they will also uh, cook rice in the usual way and they call that uh, hard rice. 
uh, and that is the famous Mario Rice, actually, Padre Adan. But uh, not many people outside the Calabic community are fully aware that actually that's not the way people used to eat rice most of the time. They would eat it packed in bundles, soft or mashed up. <laughs> so here we've got some bundles. We've got uh, meat cooked in various ways and we've got some vegetables and we've got some pineapple. And um, you can also see hunting equipment and some gathered um, vegetables. So meals consist of um, rice, uh, of, of penguman, which is things to eat with rice, which are, um, it, the epitome of them is wild foods and especially uh, meat. So uh, meat is actually very significant um, in terms of, uh, in terms of the value that's placed on it and in terms of nutrition, but it's always rice that people talk about. And it, is, uh, it matters whether people are able to grow rice. How much rice you're able to provide for your dependents really matters a lot and it's what people talk about. Even though actually, if you don't have any meat, you've got a problem. But meat and all wild foods tended to be distributed very widely in the longhouse, whereas rice, is uh, owned by the hearth group that grows it. And it is only shared with other hearth groups in a context where they are visitors, as I said earlier, um, or where those people in the past were not able to grow enough rice for themselves and they would become the dependents of another hearth group. And in fact, they became equivalent to children because they were not able to maintain their own hearth group. Um, and this is a term, these people uh, were called um, de Moulin, which actually is translated as slave, is not really quite the right translation um, because these people, uh, some of them were captives, but many of them were people who found themselves unable to maintain their own hearth group and became dependent on others. Yeah, so it, it's being able to provide enough rice that really matters. Uh, but, um, and, and meat is, is uh, if someone brought back a pig in 1987 from the forest, a wild pig, they would cut it up and send the meat all over the longhouse. Uh, they didn't keep it all for themselves. They had no way of preserving it in any case. Well, there were some ways of preserving it. You could bury it underground, you could, uh, you could smoke it, but there was a limit to the amount that you could preserve like that in any case. So it was distributed and that, was, that didn't create any, any implications. It didn't imply that you were not able to do anything if you received that. It was just freely shared. And that's no longer the case. They don't, the people don't share hunted meat the same way now. Maybe it's very close family members, but not more widely. Um, so the rice meal uh, at which rice is eaten with these wild foods is essentially a sacred event. I think it's always been a sort of what you could call a sacred event. And with Christianity, it is too. And of course, that's true in other cultures too. There's a, you know, in other Christian cultures um, and Muslim cultures, and I, I imagine also Hindu and Buddhist cultures, although I'm not so familiar with those, people say prayers associated with their main meals. And this is a prayer before a rice meal here. You can see it's a serious matter. So people who eat together, um, who eat rice meals together, be, are bonded as kin. They, uh, they, if they don't belong to the same hearth group, um, they are sort of brought in temporarily if they're visitors and imaged as kin. And if they aren't able to maintain their own hearth group, they are essentially being added um, as children. Now, I didn't observe this uh, in the 80s and 90s, everybody was managing to run their own hearth groups. But I know that in the past, um, it was a very different situation. Um, there was a much greater sense of dependence on that central couple who provided for everyone else. And there were a number of people who would be associated with the central couple. Um, so in this, uh, okay, we'll go on to the couple. So <laughs> this is uh, Munad Aran and Aran Raja. Um, late, my dear friends, really. Well, wanted especially. And um, so this is a couple. 
And I, as uh, Anita said earlier, rice-based kinship is based on a feeding relationship. And um, so each heart group is headed by a couple and they are described as its Lun Marar or big people. They're responsible for providing the rice meal for other members and ensuring that there's rice to eat and Penguman to eat with it. Although, as I said, a lot of the Penguman were came in from other house groups that would send uh, meat over, also excess vegetables, and they picked a great deal of something, they'd bring that over too. And the female member of the couple takes primary responsibility for the rice growing. Before Christianity arrived, she needed to have a good relationship with Daraya, the rice spirit, in order to do this. The male member of the couple helps her in the rice fields, doing some, the, the sort of hard, uh, heavy work, and he takes responsibility for hunting, uh, bringing in meat. And she and other female members will also, of course, bring in wild vegetables, as will he if he finds any. Um, so other members of the household assist this Lun Marar couple, but it is this couple that is ultimately responsible. And this role is passed on from one couple to another traditionally. So one of their children uh, with spouse will gradually take over. And what we observed was that older couples would gradually um, back away from responsibility. Sometimes they would cook separately for a while, but um, eventually they would accept that they, they are they've become essentially dependent. And they would interestingly sometimes sit behind the hearth when that was the case. There we are. Now this is Lawi Padan, who was the headman of Padale when we were living there with his grandson, uh, Balan. So those who are fed by the Lunbarar couple are primarily their children and grandchildren. And as a couple, their achievement then is both biological and also a feeding relationship. And the feeding builds the biology, as it were. I don't know if any of you know Janet Carsten's work uh, on uh, Langkawi, but she's argued th this too, that um, feeding rice creates uh, the body in a sense, so that it's not just the biological process that takes place before a child's born, but the feeding relationship of rice, particularly after birth, that creates that kinship. Um, some communal meals. So kinship with the wider group uh, is generated as well through these uh, meals shared with a bigger group. And there are two kinds of shared meals. Uh, there is the one where everybody brings some rice and the meat is from hunted animals. Uh, and that is truly shared. And the whole community is equal there and they all bring rice and, and the meat is from a wild animal. And um, then there is the Irau feast, which I'll come to in a minute. But this, I know that this um, image of the meal in Padale is a shared meal. The other one is a photograph by Harrison. And in fact, um, Harrison is, well, it's not by Harrison, it's by one of the members of the museum staff, but Harrison and his wife, Barbara, are visible there. And they're obviously sharing a meal um, in Barrio Asal Longhouse, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, and this could be uh, an ear out, but I suspect that it is actually um, a shared rice meal that everybody has contributed to. Um, it may be that um, any collaborative members of the audience can inform me of this afterwards, whether they believe that it is um, a shared meal or an irau. So these communal meals that are shared create a sense of everyone being kin within the longhouse and within the wider community if people come in from outside, because they're often held when there are visitors. Now, this is an irau, um, and we've attended many irau, obviously, but uh, this one is in Barrio Asal uh, Longhouse, the, the photograph in the middle in 2007. The other two actually are from um, Padale, the photographs of the rice and of the meat being prepared. So just to show you that at Irao, you have this very clear bringing together of meat 
and rice without any vegetables. And it's a very clear relationship between the two. But both the rice and the meat are provided by the host couple. Um, so there's very much a sense of, uh, of them feeding everybody and of everybody being dependent uh, on that couple at that point in time, both for meat and for rice. The meat is from domestic animals for Irao. That's a very important distinction. Um, whereas at shared meals, um, they, uh, the meat is from wild animals. So it's not owned and not hosted by anybody. <clears throat> So um, at an era, uh, I would argue that in a sense, the entire community that comes along is projected as one huge hearth group, uh, which is being fed by the hosts. And rice-based kinship is imaged as being much wider, incorporating everybody who's present. And the era is centered on the hearth group of the hosts, if that's at all possible. Sometimes it's centered on the central hearth group in the longhouse. And in the past, um, they would, that would have been, um, it would have been that central couple that held an ear out. My suspicion is it was only uh, very high status uh, couples that, who were at the center of longhouses, some of which were, off, were quite small, because longhouses in the Clubbit Highlands are not huge. As I said, they, they can be as little as 10 um, hearth groups, uh, I believe, historically, although the ones that I know have been more like 25 or so, but not huge, and you've got groups of them, so uh, groups of longhouses um, together, which would have probably one central uh, longhouse with one central couple, but the other longhouses had their own um, central couples, and I uh, suspect it's only the central couples of those longhouses that held Irao. Um, because here I'll require a great deal of resources and nowadays people have access to more resources from town um, but before they they didn't because you, you they give gifts traditionally at era as well as providing um, rice and meat and being able to um, bring together that much rice is 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 quite a challenge um, in the past and in the past it was only those central couples that had really big rice fields and everyone helped them with those rice fields and that made meant them that they could actually um, host Irao in this way. So Irao uh, nowadays are held uh, to name children. Uh, so grandparents and parents take new names and many of you will know about this and many of you will know that Kalabit have got names with meanings that they take when they become parents, when they become grandparents. Um, and this is, they are, these names are taken at Irao um, and uh, so parent names are names with meanings that seem to be related to aspiration because they're young couples and uh, grandparent names are supposed to reflect achievement. Uh, so they're supposed to be meaningful names that actually reflect the character of the, um, of the male and female who take different names, whereas the parent name is the same name for them, the, the mother and the father with, with Sina, mother, in front of the name for the woman. So um, it is nowadays to name children. But in the past, Ira were held at uh, when people died, when major uh, figures died, important people died, an Ira would be held to commemorate them and to establish the status of the hosts who would be the children or grandchildren or close relatives of the person who's died. And uh, so there's been this shift uh, because uh, when children were named in the past, it seems that there may have been a, a reasonable feast, but it, uh, I don't think it was called an Irao. And uh, as far as we know, um, they were not called Irao. I stand to be corrected by any club in the audience, um, but that is my impression. Uh, they, uh, there, there could be a, a celebration to bring a child into the community and um, possibly to take a name but um, it, it seems that most people didn't take names with meanings in the past, say before the Second World War. Um, it was only very important individuals that had names with meanings. So there's been this sort of escalation of um, perhaps competition in a way to establish status by holding Irao in recent decades. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so children, 
well, this was, you know, I won't go into the pre-Christian religion and what happened when children were initiated. They haven't got time to do that. Um, uh, and here we have a photograph of um, a pig that is about to be slaughtered for an era in 1987. And um, this is to emphasize the significance of meat which is much more emphasized at Irao. So as I said, on a daily basis, it's rice, which is much more important, much more um, emphasized. But uh, at Irao, the importance of meat and of the male contribution is, is more visible, be, probably because it's a domestic animal, which is, has value therefore, and belongs to the host family. And um, uh, so, that's why I was showing. I wanted to show you this picture, which was deliberately taken as a um, as a sort of a, a commemoration of the event. So this uh, emphasizes the complementarity of male and female, uh, and I've discussed this elsewhere. The cosmological significance of the male and female um, relationship. I'll come back to it in a second. In fact, so at Irao in the past. Um, uh, there were often uh, megalithic activities going on or earth moving activities. So stones were erected, stones were carved, ditches were made. And there are many such stones and ditches in the highlands. We were recording these during the Culture Drain Forest project and, um, and other researchers have also uh, recorded the present, the, the location of the, these, these stones. Um, this is a stone figure up on a ridge going towards Kalimantan. Uh, and uh, it is uh, said to have been erected at an era of the past, although uh, we don't know what era. And indeed, this may be very, very old. It's, it's difficult to date it, uh, but it, it, um, it's, it, it's got an eerie echo of the Santubong figure. Um, so it seems that you know, this kind of figure uh, was significant more widely in, in the region. Um, now, the, the human figure is associated with status, um, you know, on, uh, on handicrafts in Borneo, among the hierarchical groups like um, the Kayan. It was only the so-called aristocrats, the high status people, who um, could uh, use the human figure. So that is of some significance. So this is associated with status. And as I said, Irao in the past were very much associated with status and with hierarchy. Um, and um, the people that held them, the high status people were called Lunmaratoo, uh, Lun really big people. So they were the, the, the parents in a sense, because Lunmarat is what parents and grandparents, the couple at the center of the hearth group are called. So really big people are those who are the couple that head the much bigger hearth group, that's the whole kin group, which is why, I'm calling this rice-based kinship, and I would say that, um, well, this is uh, because it is based on feeding the rice meal, and this kinship has levels, so there's a hearth group level, there's the longhouse level, and there's the uh, group of longhouses level, the whole of the Kalabic community imaged as a hearth group with these high status couples at the head. Uh, but feeding everybody, taking responsibility for everybody, uh, both from the point of view of rice associated with women and uh, meat and the wild associated with men. And I've elsewhere discussed the, the fact that meat is associated with bringing in wildlife force, which the Kalabic call lalud, which is then processed through the rice meal um, and creates human kinship by being you know, passed on to dependents. So um, the rice meal is central to all of this. Now, these are two images that were uh, of paintings that were created by uh, Stephen Bayer. And uh, some of you will know who Stephen Bayer is, a Kalabit artist who's now living in Denmark, in fact, but um, lived for many years in the Kalabit Highlands until recently. And I commissioned him to do some paintings for my book, Tukadrini, Cosmic Traveller. And Tukadrini is um, a Kalabic culture hero uh, of great power. And you can see the power shimmering off him in this painting. Um, this painting is called Tukadrini Shimmering with Lalud, in fact, with cosmic power. And um, 
his wife, Araring Mnapo Boong, is here pictured in his earring because he went to a, um, an earow at a longhouse up in the sky and he took her in his earring with him. But she is um, associated in the story of Tukadrini, which is in the book, the, well, the legend, shall we say, of Tukadrini. Um, she's associated with rice growing. He's associated with going off into the wild and doing lots of head hunting and, and hunting of animals and coming back to bring the heads and the meat back. Uh, and then a big Irao feast is held to celebrate the achievement of the two of them. So um, they are both of great significance, although the, the, the story is mostly about his adventures in, in the wild spirit world in which um, he accesses uh, this, this cosmic power, this Lalud, and does battle with spirits and, and bests them all. Um, he cannot do anything with what he brings back unless um, his wife uh, grows rice and because they eat the, the food uh, that it derives from the meat together with rice. And I would argue also the cosmic power that he brings in must be joined with the female power to be passed on to um, dependents and descendants. Um, and they are therefore of uh, great uh, status and able to care for everybody. Um, now, um, this is Na'am Tanand. I, I commissioned her to uh, create some, to make some pots for me. Uh, and I think these are the last Kalabit um, tuning that were ever made. Uh, this was in 1987. And there they are drying above her. And this is just to emphasize the uh, association between cooking and the hearth, um, and finally. And here we are at our hearth uh, in 1988, uh, somehow managing to keep it going. Uh, new parents created uh, uh, newly uh, just before we arrived. And because we were new parents, we were not allowed to live with anyone else. Um, we initially stayed with uh, the late Bayaribu and his wife, Sina Bayaribu. Um, he was the headmaster of Padali School at the time. We stayed there with them for a month, which was wonderful. But then we were told, you cannot live with anyone else because you have a child. You are a couple that should be at the center of a heart group. You must have your own tatal. And so we rented a tatal in the longhouse and moved in and managed our own tatal. And there we are trying to do this here. So um, thank you. That is the end of the talk. And I'm just finishing with fire because as I said earlier, obviously fire is so central to being human, uh, it makes it possible for us to cook. And all human societies seem to have used fire to create communal meals eaten together, which generate human society and kinship. And I would argue often also hierarchy grounded in feeding. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. That was actually very fascinating. Um, I like the picture of you and um, Kaz and Molly um, and the fire going on behind you. You said you couldn't keep it going. <laughs> oh, we managed to keep the fire going. Didn't always manage to keep the hearth very clean. <laughs> that was the problem. <laughs> oh, great. No, that was, that was really, um, I think this is part of um, this whole festival that we've got is trying to capture and learn more about where a lot of our heritage and a lot of our um, cultures come from. And that was an excellent view of, you know, the half and as you said, kinship, kinship, food being part of kinship. And of course, rice is the most important one there. But, you know, as you said, with the irao, you've got meat. Um, hmm. Make, made me think a lot. Um, oh, I'd like to go and discover a bit more, I think. Um, <laughs> oh, here we are, there's someone else admitting, coming in. Um, thank you very much for that. And 
on that note, have we got anyone who'd like to ask a question? I haven't seen any up on the chat. You've got to get your fingers working very fast here. No? Keep closing the wrong button. Okay, how about um, anyone up the top? We've got George and Diana Bromwich and Val Nashman, Ross Southern. Any of you would like to ask a question? And it's not about rice cooking? No. <laughs> I must have uh, answered all the potential questions. Everyone understands everything. Actually, I did have a question when you you said something about when you looked at that stone carving and you said it's very similar to the Santabong figure um, to a layperson like me who's not an anthropologist, which what is the Santabong figure? Well, there's a carved figure there. Ah, it's not easy to find, but it's very similar. Yeah. OK, OK. Uh, in fact, I'm not okay. managed to find it yet. I must go and try and find it. But it's um yeah, it's very similar. Okay, it's not amongst that Sungai Jiang, um, all the both the, the the domed stones in Sungai Jiang in Santabong. I'm not entirely sure of the exact location of it. I'm ashamed okay. to say, and uh, I um, it's one of the things I must go and do. But I believe it's rather covered over. But well, okay. Um, there's a question from Diana. Um, uh, okay, not, Diana, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, it's not actually a question. I just wanted to say thank you very much to Monica. Sorry, the camera on my computer doesn't work, so it's not particularly that I'm hiding. Um, yes, thank you, Monica, for, for the talk this morning and sending me the link. Um, and also thank you for um, mentioning my uncle, Guy Arnold. Um, and, um, you know, I very much hope that uh, I'm able to get out to Sarawak and um, see where he travelled um, early next year sometime. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And thank you for your book as well, which I've read and, um, you know, could um, recognise some of what you were talking about this morning. So, yes, many thanks. <laughs> Lovely to hear from you, Diana. <laughs> Anyone else? No hands? No. No. Well, um, on that note, there might be people rushing off to go and have dinner at this, um, the last of the big dinners at the hearth at um, um, Fort Margarita. So perhaps we'll stop. Um, Monica, thank you very much again for an excellent talk. We look forward to seeing you back in Kuching in a few months, in a couple of months' time. And no, less you might than get a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Oh, oh, that's soon. Okay. Okay, that's straight great. after Christmas. Um, yeah. in a couple of weeks' time, and you might get roped in to do another talk as well. So come prepared. In person, I hope. <laughs> yes, in person this <laughs> time. Always which would be good to which would be good to do. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining into the talk. I hope you've got um, lots of information from Monica about the hearth and rice and kinship in the Highlands. So good night and have a good evening. Well, actually, Monica and all of those in England um, have a good day the rest of the day. Have a good Sunday. And um, for all of us here, have a good night in Kuching. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you bye -bye. very much. <laughs>